I would have to say all of my books are probably based on family stories, but remember I was raised in a household where the old members of my family lived with us. And there was something wonderful about sitting at their knee and listening to how things were. And now it's interesting, that's what I've become in my family. I'm the one who now tells them how things were. And it, it, it gave us a sense of our place, it gave us a sense of our birth order, it gave us a sense that we were loved long before we were ever born. My grandmother, she was the penultimate storyteller. She, uh, she was from Russia, actually from the Ukraine, Bielorussia. She had a thick accent. And every night she used to tell us tales because when I was young, televisions had been invented, but they were very expensive. And our family was poor. We couldn't afford one. So she used to do what she called fire talking every night. She put a fire in the fireplace. She'd pop popcorn. She would make fudge if we were really lucky. She'd pick snow apples fresh off from the tree outside of the kitchen. My brother and I'd go in with our little bowls, and she'd put wedged apple and popcorn and fudge in the bowl, and she'd say, go in living room because now I'm going to come in and fire talk to you. And we did. We'd go in and sit down, and she would explode into story. And we heard her stories thousands of times. And the beauty of telling, or even reading for that matter, but telling especially, is watching the person's eyes that you're telling the story to. And if their eyes get bigger, you add stuff to the story. And she certainly did. I do know whenever she finished a story, my brother and I would always lean into her and say, okay, that story you just told, is that a true story? And she'd look at us over her glasses and say, well, of course it's a true story. But it may not have happened. Our family was multicultural. I mean, even within our own household, we had people of different belief systems, different uh, countries of origin. And then, of course, I grew up in a city in Oakland where my neighbors came in as many colors, ideas, and religions as there are people. So if this is a part of your life, and in my case it was, I think it was pretty natural to write from that point of view. What's interesting, you know, I've moved back to rural America. I've moved away from the city. And I didn't realize that not every child has the glory of growing up in a neighborhood where people are different than they are. And they don't have the glory of understanding why other people do what they do and say different prayers and eat different food and perhaps even dress differently or look differently. So I think that's another thing literature, especially multi -literature, multicultural literature does, is it, it gives them an understanding that they, they otherwise are not going to have. They're not going to hear it in their own homes. So if they can read authentic stories and understand that the heart of humanity is the same, doesn't matter how we're packaged on the outside, we're all the same. I think that's, that, that does a great service to molding a child to be a citizen of the world. I thought, you know, I would like to write a story where the issue of the color of someone's skin is truly an issue. And in Mr. Lincoln's way, that's the issue. It wasn't the child's issue. Well, it was secondhand. He was bringing his parents' point of view into that school. So they had to find something that was common between them. And Mr. Lincoln, the black principal, this is a white child, black principal, and the child, it's implied in the story, but he comes from a white supremacist family. That's his point of view. And he, he really loves this principal, but he, he, he does not dare have any interaction with him. So what they find that is common between them is their love of birds. And it happens their school has this atrium that's empty because they apparently didn't have the right you know, bushes and things to attract a population of birds. So that's what they work on together. And I guess what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter how different we are. There is something we can find that we have in common. And that should be the place that we start from, is understanding what we're, our commonality, and then from there celebrating our difference instead of uh, having difference be a cause for a feeling of isolation. 
And I remember one day he asked me to stay after to wash blackboards. Now this, is, this wasn't a punishment. This was a pleasure because we all adored him. And while I was washing the blackboard, I'll never forget this, he had My Fair Lady, he put on My Fair Lady. And he asked me to make numbers and letters with this wet sponge. And I did, and I think that is where the code showed up. That's when he realized I couldn't do it. And that I wasn't translating and reading, that something was wrong. And I remember he came up to me, his hand went right in the center of his back, and as I'm telling you this, I swear to God, I can still feel the warmth of his hands. And he slid down next to me and he says, oh honey, I think you have something that has a name. He said, you feel, you feel dumb, don't you? And I remember just bursting into tears and wanting to run away because of all people I wanted him to like me and I thought if he knew I was dumb he wouldn't like me anymore and instead he opened the world up he paid out of his own pocket for a specialist to work with me and this was before we had reading specialists like we do now and I can't tell you what method worked we did colored acetates we did balance board we did literally physical exercise MC Escher paintings I mean you name it we did it but I will never forget the day that I could look at something on a piece of paper or in a book, get a mental image, and something would come out of my mouth that was the same thing. This was a miracle. So I said one word, and it was right. Then pretty soon it was a sentence. It was right. Pretty soon a paragraph. And then finally an entire page. So he changed everything. Changed everything for me. I love black and white photography. I personally feel you get more color in black and white photo photography than you do in color photography. If a photographer is hearing this, they'll understand what I mean. It's the contrast. Contrasts in black and white, I think, are rich and beautiful. And sometimes I like to draw the faces with these contrasts and half tones because to me it, it actually can bring in more detail than if you put it in color. So that's deliberate. I will do it as if this is a photograph and then the patterns of their clothes are, are almost an independent art that has to, do, has to do with the overall composition, but their faces are these wonderful black and white images. In the Keeping Quilt, for instance, that um, was done entirely in black and white except for the quilt. And the origin of the quilt, anybody's clothes that went into that quilt, their clothes were in color so that the children could understand this is what eventually ended up in this quilt. So sometimes I will do it for a reason. In Betty Doll, the entire book was in black and white except for the doll. So you know, I guess I use it as a technique to kind of say to a child, this is the focus, but here's the story around it. I'm from the Midwest, and interestingly enough, all the years I lived in California, of course, we don't, you don't have thunderstorms in California, not like you do in the Midwest. I think people in other states don't understand. Our thunder in the Midwest is so loud. It shakes the windows, shakes the house, shakes the floor. It's almost like an earthquake. So as a young person, of course, this terrified me, terrified me. And I'd go dive under the bed. And, and one day my grandmother kind of pulled me out from under the bed and said, well, you know, it's perfect day to go make thunder cake. And I kind of said, well, what's that? And she got the ingredients out. And this meant we had to do different things to get the ingredients. The chocolate and the flour were kept out in the dry shed, which really wasn't that far from the house. But to a child, this is, this is the last mile of your life to go out there and get that, especially all those clouds are coming in. And we'd hear the thunder see the lightning and she she would have me do it I did it anyway and that's where I learned also when you see the lightning crack did you know it's scientific that when you count slowly when you hear the thunder that's actually how many miles away the storm is so we would do the countdown as the storm was getting closer so she had me go in that shed she stood there I mean she didn't leave me alone and I, I, I was afraid because there were spiders and things in there that I didn't, I just didn't want to go in there.
but I'd get the little bag of flour and grab the little thing of chocolate and she had me climb a trellis to get some tomatoes and go get milk and we had a cow that kicked and she didn't make me milk the cow but she made me you know she didn't make me I stood there while she was milking but I was afraid of her and I went to get eggs from a hen I don't know if you can see it but I still have the scar right here because that hen one day grabbed me right, right here and then they hit you with their wings. So I was afraid of that chicken. At any rate, when we got into the house and put all the ingredients together, she said, well, you know, all of the things you did today means you're very brave. And I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm scared to death. She says, yes, but I faced all of the fear. And that's when she made me realize thunder was only a noise. That's all it is. The Reading Rockets Meet the Author series is a production of WETA. Major funding for Reading Rockets comes from the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. For more author interviews, recommended reading lists, and information about teaching kids to read, please visit us online at www.readingrockets.org.